Abraham College, 1773 to 1843. He was a professor of anatomy, surgery, and physiology. And he was the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland twice. And during his presidential address one year, he talked about this fracture, the distal radius fracture. This fracture takes place, he said, about an inch and a half above the carpal extremity, the radius. This was 1814, about 81 years before x-rays were discovered and the first rentgenogram was made. And according to Professor Colley's treatment ought to focus on manipulation, making a moderate extension until the surgeon observes the limb restored to its natural form, followed by maintenance uh, with using a thick and firm compress applied on the anterior surface of the limb and a very narrow wooden splint along the naked side of the ulna. And the latter splint, I now think, should be used in every instance. And the outcome, Professor Colley said, was the limb will at some remote period again enjoy perfect freedom in its motions and be completely exempt from pain. The deformity, however, will remain undiminished throughout life. And the key here is he didn't say full motion, just said motion in every plane. And so the question for us today is now, really? In an era when we can now land a rover the size of an SUV on planet Mars? Is that really the best we can do for radius fractures? And if we can do better, then what are the pearls and pitfalls of doing so? The radius fracture is relevant. The distal radius fracture is in fact, among the most common orthopedic fractures in the Western world. There are over 600,000 ER visits per year just in this country alone, with or without the pandemic, and 1.6 fractures per thousand people. The distribution of distal radius fractures in the general population is generally bimodal, either young men in high energy trauma or older and usually female patients who sustain lower energy, usually falls often with underlying osteopenia and osteoporosis. Again, history matters. It's important to take the history from our patients because that often tips us off under the pearls section here, tips us off to likely associated injuries. There could be radial head injury and elbow injury as shown here on the film or TFC injury in the wrist and nerve injuries, especially immediate nerve problems as Neil talked about today. And in the history section, the pitfalls to avoid are failing to have the pain management discussion before any treatment is instituted. We've touched on, and I'll touch on again, the opioid epidemic. It's important to have that discussion before surgery so that the patients are appropriately counseled and ready for what's coming. And then as a pitfall, figure out whether surgery is even indicated and if that's the best option. History matters. Sometimes if we take a good history, find out an unusual fracture mechanism, which may tip us off to associated injuries. This is a case of an open distal radius fracture inflicted by a bear mauling. This was reported in JBJS and it happened in Jacksonville, Florida, but that's why in California, we hate bears. Cal sucks, Stanford rocks. You can put that in your speaker evaluation. There might be some bias on behalf of the speaker. I'll move on. Pre-app points under the pearls section. We've taken the history and now we need to figure out what imaging is needed. And I will attest that plain films are absolutely essential, but fluoroscopy is really enormously helpful. And I do this in the office. It may not be needed for reduction evaluation in the emergency room as reported by Daly and Stern a few years ago, JHS. And advanced imaging is rarely useful acutely. It's expensive and we're going to fix Humpty Dumpty based on intra-op findings of best ability while there anyway, not based on shadows seen on images preoperatively. It's also important to avoid the pitfalls of failing to recognize the patient's baseline anatomy. So sometimes it's useful to get a contralateral wrist film, especially when evaluating scapulonate alignment, for example. And as Mark Henry pointed out in this JHS article not long ago, failing to consider the associated injuries so common with distal radius fractures, scapulonate, interosseous ligament, lunotriquetral, interosseous ligament, triangular fiber cartilage disc, median nerve compression, as Neil talked about, and the distal radial ulnar joint. Once we've taken the history and evaluated the patient, we have to next figure out the best fixation method. So this was interesting to me, the JBJS that just came out last month was uh, of interest because it compared external fixation versus plate fixation. Now, in my mind, uh, external fixation is rarely used now. Usually that's reserved for polytrauma patients or those with extensive open wounds. And among the plate fixation 
champions, there are a plethora of vendors and options available. The key here is to pick one and get good at using it. But since this was in the most recent JBJS, I thought it was interesting to go through these, which was a multi-center randomized control trial of fractures, 75 treated with volar locking plate and 81 with external fixation, 40 surgeons in Norway, thus a homogeneous population. There were clear differences in reported outcomes the patients described at six weeks and three months, no significant differences at 12 months, but I submit that those first three months do matter. So my personal choice for fixation is plate fixation. And I just picked out a couple of recent examples from my own patients. This is a 28 year old woman, one year post-op. Uh, this volar spike here as seen on the lateral view will likely be a problem for the flexor tendons in the median nerve. And so fracture fixation with plate fixation through a volar approach is very helpful. It's important intraoperatively also to get the x-ray beam gantry angled the right way so that one can make sure that there is subchondral support here as illustrated and on the lateral view that the elbow is flexed, flexed slightly so that one is really looking right down the barrel of the radiocarpal joint to assure that that is a congruent surface. A couple of other different examples, a 79 year old woman with more osteoporosis with a good outcome and restoration of anatomy using a volar plate. And I also like it because it allows, and this is a 64 year old woman, three months post-op allows restoration and realignment in the radial ulnar deviation plane when that happens, as you see here with plate fixation allows restoration of that. But certainly there are alternative fixation choices the spanning bridge plate has been studied and reported in a few JHS articles not long ago. And the spanning bridge plate across the whole radius is usually used in the polytrauma situation more often than not. Another alternative fixation choice is limited hardware. So in the middle of the slide here, we see the very common fracture patterns of the distal radius. And sometimes a single cannulated screw can be used to buttress the linear facet of the distal radius, for example or the radial styloid with a single cannulated screw, for example. And sometimes the combination of hardware is a good alternative fixation choice. Now, some years ago, there was a more of a debate uh, in our world of hand surgery about the necessity for fragment specific fixation. And in fact, uh, Leanne Benson and Peter Stern all reported uh, looking at this, is it needed to have fragment specific fixation? The answer was, the results were equivocal to standard fixation. So we don't necessarily need to do that, but sometimes combinations are very useful as shown in a couple of examples here, wires and screws supplementing more complicated injuries. And for example, the radial pin plate might be used. So sometimes plate fixation with additional screws and wire constructs are useful. Another alternative fixation choice are intramedullary nails. Now this is a this has been studied in a few instances. Uh, this was a randomized comparison of volar locking plates with IM nails, and in addition, a similar study dorsal IM nailing versus plating. Uh, this was a uh, a uh, Cochrane analysis and found that in fact the volar locking plate performed better. This was reported in orthopedic trauma. And sometimes arthroscopic assistance is useful. So a few pictures, interest operative image of the fracture and the shaver being prepared and reduced here in the middle picture and fixed with a cannulated screw. So the intra-op pearls. Now, a few points I wanted to make here were first about the soft tissue handling. It's important to avoid bone stripping and further damage to the vessels, particularly the radial artery and tendons. So primum non nocere. And consider the intra-op management of the median nerve. Is a carpal tunnel release needed? We heard today from Neil about this. And fragment specific fixation that requires more incisions and more hardware that may not be needed versus just good enough for fixing the fracture. And another intra pearl to consider is the use of bone graft or bone graft uh, substitute. Sometimes it's helpful to consent the patients in advance just in case if you're thinking about that, but there'll be a lot more on uh, different COA sessions on this specific topic during our annual meeting. Intra-op pitfalls I wanted to highlight were first the distal radiowalner joint. It is important to check its stability and stabilize as needed, including when we're tipped off about the large ulnar styloid base fracture, which is widely displaced. 
may be a hint that the DRUJ is unstable. And also, as Chris D pointed out in his guest editorial in JBJS last month, what's new in hand and wrist surgery? He pointed out the potential problem of injuring the extensor tendons if one is placing hardware from the volar aspect and drives all the way through the dorsal rim. So watch out and avoid that. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about post-op pearls as well. So first, in terms of pain management. Here, it's important to hearken back to that pre-op discussion and the coaching we had with our patients about the importance of managing their pain and being aware, we surgeons, being aware of the opioid epidemic. So we talk to them before surgery. <clears throat> it's important to talk to them immediately after and subsequently about how to manage their pain, hopefully without narcotics. The other post-op pearl to mention is early mobilization does matter. And in some cases, judicious use of hand therapy can be very useful. <clears throat> now, in the post-op arena, the main pearls here I would talk about are the fact that the US Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, in his address to the AMA House of Delegates just two and a half years ago, pointed out that there is one opioid overdose death every 12 and a half minutes in the United States. So we're trying to avoid adding to this problem as we're talking about managing the pain that comes with distal radius fractures. It's also important to keep this pendulum concept in mind. Think back, 1996 was the year that OxyContin was first formulated and available. And we were told, we surgeons were told, we have to control all of our patients' pain. There ought to be zero pain. And that was uh, HCAP score, the hospitals being evaluated on that. And look how far the pendulum has swung now, 2021. Now we surgeons are responsible for all the drug deaths that are happening and how far the pendulum is likely to swing back remains to be seen. But this fifth vital sign campaign was such a devastating problem for many of us. I would like to point out a few points really though about the supervised occupational therapy and hand therapy, because in my mind, this is often an, an open and unsolved question. So I spent some time studying this and I would point out a few of the following points for our audience. First is that early mobilization is certainly beneficial. The Cochrane analysis that Handel and all did showed that there were better short-term improvements in pinch, grip, and range of motion. Valdez and that group reported initially that those patients that received early range of motion needed significantly fewer therapy visits overall, and in fact attained functional range of motion of wrist and forearm significantly faster. And the same group reported that supervised occupational therapy may be beneficial for those patients that we see that have the stiff diabetic hand, the stiff fingers, and other comorbidities. Now, others have argued that while early mobilization may be beneficial, maybe it's just as good if the patients do that as a home exercise program. So two randomized control trials found the patients with a home exercise program, instead of formal supervised therapy, had significantly greater improvement in their functional outcomes at six weeks, as well as at three months and six months. I contend that there may well be confounding effects. Now, it's clear that there are benefits in some studies to early supervised occupational therapy. Watt et al. reported on this and said that patients with this fracture did better with supervised therapy. K et al. reported on this as well, said the specific training their patients got, they did better uh, over a randomized trial than those that just did a home exercise program. So with this in mind, Jennifer Walji reported with her group about the variabilities in who is referred to a therapist. So she reported that patient predictors of therapy included those patients that were younger, female, had higher socioeconomic status and fewer comorbidity conditions. So in fact, those are the patients that have the financial wherewithal to get to a therapist and the ability to do so and are younger and healthier so they're getting referred to therapy. She pointed out, Jen Walji pointed out that only 20% of patients receive either physical or occupational therapy following distal radius fractures. And also that the distal radius fracture 
therapy protocols can vary widely from massage, soft tissue treatment, manual therapy, hot and cold modalities, e-stim, ultrasound, whirlpool, and other modalities. Post-op management also has to focus on the management of the distal radial ulnar joint. The patient referred to me with a large ulnar styloid fragment. The lateral MRI shows dorsal subluxation of the distal ulna relative to the radius. We all know that ulna is actually the stable strut and the radius subluxates relative to that, but that's the common terminology, the dorsal subluxation of the ulna. And sometimes managing that winds up with the ultimate end game, which is a, a salvage procedure. So that is the salve capange procedure as shown here. It's important to distinguish between ulnar impaction, the ulnar head crashing into the carpus versus ulnar impingement, the distal ulna post-resection crashing into the distal radius. And a few post-op pearls and pitfalls to be aware of, managing bent and broken hardware. I found this was quite interesting actually. It's a case report in JBJS. They had a patient, they did ORAF, patient went out, smashed his wrist again and bent the hardware they put in. So they took the patient back to the operating room and just bent it back again. Curious. Tendon ruptures. Overall after ORIF. And in addition, post-op pitfalls to be aware of if the hardware is taken out, Remember that may leave a stress riser post removal as shown by the screw hole marks here in an MRI in a patient that had been referred to me. And keep in mind the, the caveats that Chris D put in his JBJS, what's new in hand surgery last month, those problems with flexor and extensor tendon ruptures. And finally, keep in mind complex regional pain syndrome. And I think if we have time, Amy Ladd is gonna talk a bit about that. So in summary, the distal radius fracture can be considered in several ways. And some key points are first to diagnose it and evaluate for the associated injuries. At least have considered them so that you're ready to address them intraoperatively as needed. Stabilizing the fracture. If the fracture warrants surgery, be sure to achieve stability to allow that early motion as we've talked about, and then rehabilitate. Initiate early range of motion and rehab to avoid problems and maximize outcomes.